because uh, over summer hasn't been too bad, but I've had a mild cockroach problem. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, it turns out those cockroach baits are not that effective. So I had a... And, and so there's two reasons for telling you this. One is uh, the place is a bit of a mess because I had a guy come in and do a spray mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. and he asked me not to clean for a bit because you want the cockroaches to come and step on it and have a little taste and take it back to wherever they live and pass it on and it's genocide for those little fuckers. So you are, you are a pro-genocide of, um, of invasive insects? Mate, I've, I've grown a little Hitler moustache. I've, uh, <laughs> I've, to, I've gone to town on these assholes. They're the are they... Are they big? Are they fat cockroaches? No, or German they're the cockroaches? German ones. They're yeah. the fucking worst. Yeah, German cockroaches are the worst. Yeah, and at, so at the risk of sounding racist, right? Yeah, <laughs> like look, as a as a white man, I feel bad about saying this, but uh, cockroaches are disgusting. And so, but the uh, but so a, I just wanted to apologise that this place is slightly grotty for what I'm comfortable with. But the other reason I wanted to tell you mm. is that when the guy turned up. He said to me, oh, it's not too bad. And I said, oh, I, I didn't think it was bad. I just need to get rid of them. And he said, yeah, yeah. Look, as soon as I walked in, like, I couldn't smell anything. So I thought it was fine. And I said, what? <laughs> what are you? And he said, yeah, you can normally smell it. And I said, what, the, what, what do you mean? He, he said it has a very distinct smell. And I was like, well, what does it smell like? And he just kind of looked up and he went, yeah, I don't know. It kind of smells like <laughs> death. And I went, oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> What kind of fucking dive joints is he bombing? Oh, right. <laughs> like, it was like I had like visions of, you know, the kind of places that David Fincher would have said, this is perfect for seven, yeah, you yeah. know? <laughs> but We're shooting the gluttony scene here. Right. Uh, it freaked me out, actually. It yeah, was right. one of the grossest things that someone has said to me in a long time. <laughs> and I work, you know, behind the scenes in commercial radio. I, <laughs> I have gross things said to me on a consistent basis. Was he one of those... Um, Pest control guys that takes a lot of delight in his work. Uh, oh yeah, no, he he wasn't quite like that. You know what? He was a dude who just gets the job done. Yeah, right. Came in, just kind of explained what he was doing. Really nailed everything. And do you think? Do you think it would have a um, long term negative psychic impact on you? Just genociding communities all day. Like I know they're just cockroach. Like because you wouldn't deal with our house at all. We we've got. Every summer we have a massive cockroach infestation. Right. And all three of us that live in the house are whatever, fucking pseudo new wave, hippie, right. love, life, etc. Right. people. So we always have the debate at the beginning of summer, like what are we going to do? And right. ultimately we all come to the conclusion of... They're just trying to live, man. Let's just, let's just batten down the hatches and deal with it for three months. But it does border on... It's fucking disgusting. Like you yeah. turn the light on in the middle of the night, and it's you know you know when they freeze, it's like the cockroach disco party, and then oh, yeah. of them just freeze and then like, what? And then just scatter. Nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fucking disgusting. No, but we I, can't bring ourselves to do anything. No, I my uh, desire to have things clean uh, overrides uh, <laughs> their <laughs> opportunity for life. I have, <laughs> I I have you know some of those bigger ones. Uh, that, that I've very rarely actually seen. I've, I've, I've captured them and then just gone to the balcony and thrown them out into oh, that's nice. my rape, rapey alley. Um, <laughs> bad time to stumble on a word. But the uh, <laughs> but these, there were just too many of them. They're too hard to catch. I am wiping them out. Yeah, the German cockroaches are particularly insidious. See, we've only got, we don't have those. We've got the big guys. Right. And I don't know. You can kind of anthropomorphize those guys enough to right. not... I don't know. Are they even that dirty cockroaches? I don't know. We're just kind of giving them that. Well, if the guy reckons you can smell them and they smell like death, that says to me there's something. I reckon I'm having a guess they they must smell a bit metallic. If any, you know what? If anyone has actually smelt them, can they? Can you let let us know on the Facebook page because uh, (laughs) because death was. Don't get me wrong. It was entertaining, but I'm I'm still not sure what. Because cockroach is. shit smells bad. See, now I'm wondering if our kitchen smells like death and we're just so uh, used to it that we don't smell it. Mate, I mate, don't think so. Maybe I need to come over and fucking lay, take lay a the hammer down. They're all, they're all fucking off now that it's you know, right. the cold setting in. But um, yeah. I've smelled cockroach shit is an unpleasant smell. But death to me is rotting meat. 
Right. You know, that's like a That's, that's funny. A really that's what I thought as well. Smell. Yeah, yeah. Like I've had dead rats under the couch that we didn't know were there for, you oh. know, until they started bloating and Jesus. Yeah, and that is the smell of death. Right. The smell of fucking death. Yeah, I once found a d- this is bad podcast conversation, but anyway, <laughs> I once found <laughs> I once found a dead rat under the couch and its guts had liquefied and the maggots were on the verge of um, hatching. Right. And as I was cleaning it up, like mum and dad f- um, blowfly were getting right up in my face. Like, fuck you, not just as they're about to hatch. Oh my and Lord. And that was, that was literally the smell of death. The, the worst fucking smell on earth. Well, that's put me off lunch. And Sorry, buddy. No, that's all right. Far <laughs> out. That is full on, isn't it? Yeah, when, when, when things liquefy, that's when it, you've got to it a bit too late. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> God. Anyway, so that, that I just want to apologize for this. But uh, I, it's I okay. Have, I like the wreck of your socks and undies. You, yeah. The lion man socks. Oh, yeah. So I bought them when <laughs> I, for some reason, uh, where did I go? I went into state and I'd just completely forgotten to take socks. Uh-huh. Uh, I somehow had just missed that in the packing and uh, was going past the place and I saw all these uh, Iron Man socks and I thought, oh, that'll be funny to get. And then I got them and then na- now I've got Iron Man socks at 44. <laughs> and it, they're, they're, they're my around the house socks. Yeah, yeah. No, they're, yeah. they're not the going out in uh, sandals and picking up socks. Yeah. G'day, ladies. Uh, <laughs> Do you, would you like an Iron Man in your bed tonight? <laughs> I'll keep the socks on. Oh, yuck. Uh, boo. Boo. You're going to die alone, Hamo. <laughs> no, they're more, they're, they're more my Tony Stark risky business around the house socks. Oh, very nice. Very yeah. nice. Okay. Uh, I just slide into rooms and <laughs> throw out quotes. By the way, did you happen to see any of the mm. photos from the new Thor movie? Do you know that my roommate, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but my roommate has been working on the oh, new Thor. right. So I actually have seen a lot of stuff before the photos came out. Jeez, how good does Jeff Goldblum look? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She Master. was talking about um, Jeff Goldblum on set and he's got yeah. like silver toenail polish and right. he's just cruising around. And, I just, I just uh, threw it out there on Twitter that I, I, this is how I choose to believe Jeff Goldblum looks when no one's around. <laughs> like, that's just what he is in his house. Because he is one of those kind of magical, mystical actors who, you know, pops in and, you know, uh, even when you see interviews with him, you're like, man, whatever you've got going on is 100% Jeff Goldblum. Oh, totally. Yeah. Well, my roommate said that's exactly what he's like, that he would glide into the makeup tent and be like, mm, ladies. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> invite them out to jazz clubs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, like one of those <laughs> heterosexual camp dudes. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Heaps of fun to be around. He seems to be one of those dudes that um, the Hollywood machine hasn't totally poisoned. Like, he still maintained a sense of his own individuality. Yes. And uh. so, because he's a step removed from it. Yeah. Hey, have you seen Logan? I have seen Logan. Man. Yeah. Did you enjoy? I did enjoy it. It wasn't... I, I, look, look I are you going to be one of these guys? Mm, I think uh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm going to come at it from an angle that hang, you probably haven't heard. Hang on a sec. If you haven't seen it, spoilers are about to happen. Are we going to do spoilers? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've just given... My, my, my issue, and I don't know if I am... Nah, you're wrong. I, no, I'm joking. Yeah. No. I don't know if I'm turning into a big fat sook the older I get. Mm. But I found the violence to be t- excessive and too much. And yeah, I, I can and, get that. And, and It's a bit sooky, but I can get that. You know what I mean? Like, I always used to... I guess when I was growing up watching, like, the Batman animated series. And, right. you know, Batman would punch someone off a bridge or something. And they'd fall... And they'd always have the obligatory shot of the person breaching the water and <gasps> oh, just to assure the kids he's not dead yeah. batman doesn't kill anyone yeah and i remember as a kid watching that going that's so stupid if that guy got punched off a bridge he'd be totally dead right just fucking kill the guy and now all these you know a lot of the dc animations doing that now as well where it's like nah that guy's definitely dead right and you're seeing a lot more of the consequence and i don't know like i don't think i like it it I, really upsets me well to be honest i don't cope very well with violence as uh, anywhere near like I used to. No. Like, you know, when you were a kid, it was like it was exhilarating. Yeah. But now I find it, uh, I, I do find it confronting. Mm. But here's the thing. Nobody in the real world has adamantium claws. I so know. There's, there's a part of it that is so removed from, even though it was given like that kind of realistic cowboy setting, yeah. it, it's not real. No, look, I know and that. I would have had a lot more issue if he was holding a knife 
cutting lots of people because that shit does happen. True, true. So yeah, the more no, realistic it is, the more issue I have with it. Uh, feeding into this this idea that I'm turning into a big fat sook, I think the <laughs> other part of it, the other side of it is, there's that part of me going, oh, a lot of kids are going to watch this. You know, like it's a superhero. It's like Deadpool. Like yeah. Every kid has seen Deadpool and no right. kid should have seen Deadpool. No kid should have seen Deadpool. fucking all. No. But of course, you've got a guy in a superhero costume. Yeah. And kids are just going to seek it out and see it. And I guess... But the whole movie is 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 about the violence of the character and the violence that's followed him through his life. Totally. And, and stopped him from being able to connect to a real life. And totally. So the, and so I think... So in that case, I think the violence is actually justified. And... and you know, the lesson that he's trying to impart upon his daughter slash clone yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is is that lesson. Yeah, I know. And this is and this is where I am at war with my own head because the rational part of me says absolutely you're correct. Yeah. And that there should be the scope to have an adult superhero movie that's yeah. full of heavy themes and violence. And then there's that other part of me that's turning into Helen Lovejoy and going, well, think of the children. <laughs> the children are going to see this and this is too violent for the but, children. But I know, know it's fucked and I don't know. I can't switch that part of my head off. But, you know, uh, if we do think of the children, mm. what we end up with is the Wolverine. Where, I know. Uh, where they, you know, did you see that the director, uh, Mangold, who did the last film and this film, mm. You know how we have rabbited on in on podcasts and in private, just saying, "Fuck, why didn't they just finish with a hundred ninjas? Like yep. it would have been amazing." Yep. Well, that's how. From this interview, the the gist is that's how the movie was meant to finish. Oh. But the executives came in and said, "Hey, all these other superhero movies have big CGI endings. We need to sell toys, yep. and that's how you end up thinking of the kids." With of the course, Silver Samurai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it, I think the onus is more on, and and too many people. Uh, you know, not being a parent, so it's uh, slightly unfair of me to say this, but I, I can only go from the how my mum brought me up, yeah. which is, I, I think it's fine for kids to see that, and then, yeah. you know, you should talk about it, yeah. ha- and explain the themes, and explain what was going on. It's yeah. not the responsibility of the filmmaker, it's no, the it's responsibility not. of people who go to see it. And it's, and it's got the rating that says, by the way, this is really full on. <laughs> I have to admit, the first time I saw the claws go through someone's jaw and up through his head, I was like, oh my God. And then it was like, I have a feeling this is going to be the Wolverine movie I've always wanted to see. <laughs> and I took my, I took mum to see it because mum and I saw the first X-Men film. Oh, that's lovely. So I, so I said, ah. Oh. Uh, and mum enjoys The Walking Dead because she enjoys people getting, carving, caving zombies' heads. Yeah, in. yeah. And the first time the bit of violence happens, which is quite early on, yeah. I heard mum just next to me, I heard her just go, Yes, and I thought, <laughs> well, Andrea's going to love this, and and she was, she was, she was really locked in. She was really locked in, even right up until the ending, where uh, because because she lives alone, and you know, <laughs> and, and I'm starting to discover that I'm doing this, which is talking to the TV when yeah. something's happening, and I, uh, it's funny, I. Like, while I was watching all of this stuff, and then suddenly mum's just talking about right towards the end, oh, if they do this, this will fix everything. And I'm like, mum, we're in a cinema. You are <laughs> picking, not only are you talking out loud, but I reckon the people around us aren't as smart as you. So, yeah, 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 <laughs> she, you yeah, know, yeah. she worked out how the story should work out kind of thing. Did she, was she right? Sorry? Was she right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah she's completely right. Yeah, the adamantium mm. bullet. Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah. I, you know, what I liked about it, and yeah. this was, uh, I, this is the, uh, the storytelling lesson I learned from it, yeah. is that just because there is something, you know, Chekhov's gun is placed prominently, yeah, and if you understand how stories work out, this is how this is going to play out. Yeah. I didn't know how it was going to play out. Like, I didn't know... Whether he'd kill himself. I didn't know if he was going to use it on himself. I didn't know if it was going... Like, I didn't I didn't quite know. And then, and then of course, once you hit certain story beats, you yeah. go, oh, I figured this will happen. Yeah. But I still didn't know... Like, because it's his last movie, I didn't know if maybe he'd be holding against his head and the other person's head. Do you know what I mean? Like, I yeah, just didn't, yeah, yeah. I didn't quite course. know 100% how it was going to play out. And I thought that was really good storytelling. Yeah, look, I liked more of it than I did, but at, yeah, like I said, recently I am struggling with this part of my brain that, right. that I don't know, 
like you know Grant Morris a lot of Grant Morrison's writings are kind of a response to the realism that's come into comics yeah. and you know I think there's that part of me that's going just where's the joy let's right let's but like I, have you seen Batman Brave and the Bold uh, I have seen uh, episodes of that. Fucking fantastic. Yeah. It's fucking fantastic. It's an, it's, if no one's seen it, it's uh, a cartoon that's inspired by the Silver Age of comics. So it's all yeah. wacky and goofy, but it's, yeah. it's still brilliant. Um, it's really, really sharp uh, artwork as well. Yeah, nice yeah. That's Samurai yeah. Jack kind of yeah. animation style. Yeah. I don't know. I Look, I can't, I can't really put into words at the moment what's going on in my head, but the last few things I've seen, I'm just like, oh, man. Well, I, I personally, I think that's the best blockbuster I've seen in ages. And I, the second time good. I watched it, it, it sailed really quickly. And yeah. any little quibbles I had were, I discovered that they were a little bit wrong. And also, you know, like I would, you know, we're going we're, we're gonna to get, like Thor Ragnarok looks more like Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, Guardians I think that of the Galaxy fantastic. will be like Guardians of the Galaxy. Like we've got the Marvel movies, which yeah. really are popcorn for everybody kind yeah. of movies. I, I was just wrapped because watching this was like, I'm. You know what? You can't make the other. You you can't get to this movie without making the others. But I finally went. Oh, finally you got to yeah. make the movie that we always wanted yeah, and yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I thought that little girl was fantastic. was fantastic I thought the rapport between Patrick Stewart and Hugh Jackman had never been better he was the Patrick Stewart was the best part of the movie for me oh. like I thought he was fantastic he, he played that old man beautifully yeah. you know the yeah. you know when he has a go at him uh, open your mouth to show me that you've uh, Swallowed that yeah. pill and nah. <laughs> such an old man thing to do. I thought that little girl was fantastic. I thought Stephen Merchant was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really surprised at how good Merchant was, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought he got one of the best scenes as well. You know, his final scene yep. was, a, was yep. a corker. But you know what? I think Hugh Jackman was fantastic. Yeah. Just fa- like, it's really easy to take him for granted in the role. And he and, and yeah. even, the, even the bad X-Men films... He's still really good. Well, he's great in everything he's in, regardless if the movie's he's a piece solid. of shit. Like he's he's fucking just a excellent. fucking solid, excellent professional, you know? Maybe there needs to be, like, a new rating system just for superhero movies. I think because, I, uh, maybe, I, I'm trying to figure out what my issue is in real time, but I think maybe because it's predominantly been a genre or a medium that's mainly aimed at children. Mm. I think there's the assumption from a lot of people... And this is something that existed with cartoons for years, which is slowly starting to fade away. But this mm. thing of like, oh, cartoons are for kids. Mm. All cartoons are for kids. Right. And I think there's always been this assumption that all superhero stuff is for kids. Mm. You and I, who have read comics for a long time, know well that hasn't been true since you know, you know, the, the 80s. 80s. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of people that think, ah, oh, that's for kids. So they'll yeah. take their... Um, a, 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 Great comic and good friend um, Eric Hutton told a told me a fantastic story about when he went and saw Dark Knight. Yeah. So he's there on opening night of Dark Knight, and this dad comes in with like his four year old son. Right. It's a Batman movie. Let's right. watch a Batman movie. Right. <laughs> Which is again, it's a reasonable assumption. Right. Why shouldn't you be able to take a five year old to a Batman movie? Yeah. Um. So they're sitting there, and it's the opening bank heist. Right. And the kid starts going. Why did that clown kill the other clown daddy? Yeah. And the dad's like obviously been, you know, really jazzed to see this movie. And he's like, shh, shh it's fine. Just shut up, shut up. We're gonna, yeah. Let's just watch the movie. Um, and, and the kid, you know, continually is protesting throughout. Because it's a fucking disturbing opening scene. Right. Um, you know, and um, the kid keeps muttering, muttering. And then they get to the scene where Heath Ledger comes into the mob boss meeting. And he's right. like... Let's make this pencil disappear. <laughs> and apparently yeah. in one swift motion, the dad just picks his kid and goes, okay, we're out of here. And right. just leaves the cinema right. all together. Because, you know, I, I don't know if he knew that it was going to be that adult or what. But, but but also, but I put the onus back on the dad. Yeah. Like, didn't you watch the trailers? Yeah. That is not a fucking movie for a four-year-old no. from the trailers. No. Or from Batman Begins. But there is that. But so many parents will take their kids to see. And I, 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 I totally agree. The onus is on the parents. Yeah. But, but you know, know, even something like Batman Superman, Batman versus Superman, in what fucking weird reality are we living in where Batman versus Superman is a totally inappropriate movie to take a children to? Especially right. when all the merchandise and the cereal packets and right. all this stuff is geared towards the kids. And I know they've been doing that for years. I mean, they marketed 
fucking Robocop to children in yeah. the 80s, and that yeah. is not a movie yeah, for not children. A, not at all. <laughs> no, that's, it was, but yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good point, actually, in the fact that, you know, there, there has to be some uh, responsibility from the marketing side of things From the studio to things say, as well, well, but, you know, let's no, not make toys. Let's not make toys and let's just try and make a good movie. But yeah. you know, with this with this latest movie, it's called Logan as yeah. well. It's not called X Men Logan. That's true. So that's true. You know, it gives it a sense. Anyway, you know what? I don't give a fuck. I loved it. I loved it from the beginning <laughs> to the, the end. Fuck the kids. Yeah, and I, I don't care. I don't have any, so it's not my problem. And no, and uh, it's true. And Jesus, between what they see on an average day on YouTube, right, uh, is going to be a whole lot uh, more excessive than, Personally, than Logan. I, I I thought the. I thought that whole last sequence was fantastic as well, and I felt I felt real ha- anxiety for, in for the those. Woods? Yeah, 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 for all those kids. I didn't get why they didn't turn around and fight though. I didn't know why they were well, kept running. But you know, they, they don't really know. Like they're yeah. still kids. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, true, when they get true. an opportunity, they oh, man, I, they really take out that It did make me want to go. I I, I I I was surprised, and I never thought I would say this, but it did make me want to go back and watch the other Wolverine movies. <laughs> oh yeah, well you know what I also liked about it was, you know. I normally don't like comics in a movie about comic book mm. characters, but I liked it in this yep. because what it essentially said to me, this was my interpretation of it, was when he says, you know, like a, a quarter of it took place like this yep. and, you know, in the real world people died. So what that says to me is I can go back over... Because the thing that is bad about the X-Men movies is the terrible continuity, yeah. but that's what works in the favour of this film and what they've basically done to it in my book is said, you can go back and you can watch the movies that you like and decide which continuity yeah, makes yeah, it up. Enough. So I can just kind of go, oh, well, for me, it goes X-Men, uh, X-Men 2, most of the Wolverine... Uh, Days of Future Past and this. You didn't like Apocalypse, did you? Oh, I thought it was pretty terrible, but I, I was also really upset because I really love Oscar Isaac and I felt like he didn't get enough to do. I feel like me and my buddy are the only two people on planet Earth that fucking loved. I loved oh. that movie. I had the best time watching that. I just, it was oh, exactly what I wanted in that moment. But you also enjoyed Doctor Strange as well. I really struggled with that. Yeah, I rewatched it the other night. It. You know, oh, it didn't hold up. I, that's why I feel that way about most of the Marvel well, movies. But they're all like that. I mean, it's that thing where it's like, oh, we're being so innovative. This no, you're not. You put in a two minute magic mushroom sequence. It's really no different from any of the other. It's exactly right. the same fucking movie. Same shitty grey color palette. You know, I yeah. mean, I think that's what's the most interesting thing. And I'm not a big oh, fuck. I can't even believe I'm talking about this as a 35 year old man. But anyway, well, um, I'm 34, so that makes it much worse. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think the most interesting thing about the two that are coming out this year of the Marvel movies is that they've gotten rid of that ridiculous grey-blue colour palette right. and they look hyper-colour. Yeah. Can you imagine how interest- much more interesting, you know, whatever that fight at the airport in Civil War would have been if it was like all the reds were way up and all the... Right. Per- you know what I mean? Like right. a comic book splash page. Right. But because they've all got to look uniform and like the same movie, they're yeah. all grey colour palette. Um, which is, after a while, it's just like, oh, God. Yeah. Um, to me, that was the most well, interesting thing about It's Doctor fascinating, Strange, isn't it, that to, to know that Marvel are essentially making movies the way they made comics in the mm. 60s. Yeah, you totally. Know, you've got yeah. uh, Kevin Feige is the Stan Lee who's mm. telling everyone what needs to be done, and yep. then, you know, and they just kind of do it. And, 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 and you know, the, the other thing is, is those movies look really cheap when you're watching them, too, because yeah. they, they cut corners so they can make as much profit as possible yeah they look like extended episodes of a high budget tv show yeah yeah and that's not that's not a criticism but no, i mean but you know these people that are like you know oh marvel movies i just i watch the entire series and then start again from the beginning it's like, dude like oh. they got one rewatch at best for life that's it like yeah. they're very entertaining popcorn things in the yeah. moment but i ain't you know charging to even that tr- uh, trip sequence that I because re- that was the whole reason I rewatched Doctor Strange like right. oh, I want to see that thing because in my memory it was like oh it's fucking 10 minutes of the most insane shit I've ever it's 90 seconds yeah <laughs> so, but know. it was because you saw it on the big screen yeah, of course. on the big it was screen it's overwhelming and yeah, it yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so impressive yeah uh, you know what I have been watching that I have just I've seen the f- first four episodes and I am sold big time is Atlanta. Oh, yeah. We, have you seen any no. of it? So, do you know what it is? Not really. So, it's uh, the Donald Glover series that won Best Show at the Golden Globes, uh-huh. beat out Game of Thrones and all of those right. things. 
and it's it's just this uh, Donald Glover plays a guy in Atlanta who is you know to be honest struggling and maybe not incredibly reliable and he finds out that his cousin has just had a big hit as a uh, with a song called Paper Boy, and yeah. so he wants to manage him. And it's such a simple concept, but every episode has been a really fascinating vignette on on that life and that world, and really funny, but yeah, well. really funny in a realistic way. Like, the jokes never step out of the dialogue. They never step out of the narrative. And also, it just has a, a general sense of melancholia, which I, I find really appealing. Right. And Donald Glover has... It's not a vanity project. Like, that guy can sing. He's not... He does, he's not a rapper. He's not singing. Yeah, he's right. just the guy who's trying to make things happen. And somehow, when you watch it, you completely understand how all the characters in the show just kind of dismiss him and can't rely on him and are frustrated by him. Oh, but he breaks my heart. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. It's really, it's really something what, else. What network? SBS Viceland. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, All Tuesday right. nights, nine twenty, two episodes at a, a at a pop, and each episode goes for you know like, you know, there's like I think there's like four adverts in the show, so each episode goes half an hour, so they're probably like mm. twenty two minutes, right, and they yeah, just right. hit it hard, really, really deceptively funny. But I'll check it out. I've, oh, um, I was uh, the two episodes I watched last night. I, w- I went through the whole gamut of actually laughing out loud while no one was here to <laughs> feeling anxiety. You know, like like the very simple premise of uh, his sort of girlfriend he takes to dinner and he only has so much money in his account and right. the place that he's going he's heard has a has a special that. And and of course, when he gets there, they don't do that special anymore. So, <laughs> and this the waitress keeps upsizing everything, and just you know, you're just sitting there going, "Oh, I feel <laughs> nothing but stress watching all of this," <laughs> because he's properly poor as well. Like he's not, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like you know, often, often because of shows needing narrative. Uh, you know, when someone's poor, you know they can find them, they can kind of get something mm. going. But th- this he's poor, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he's really struggling. Yeah, there's so many shows where people seem to have an unlimited budget. You know, oh yeah, you know, like yeah. uh, you know the uh, the journalists on the uh, you know oh it, the best example that I can think of is uh, you know Daredevil, like they're a struggling law firm. But yeah. fuck, look at his loft. Yeah, 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 totally. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Where, are you living in the seediest part <laughs> of Hell's Kitchen? Because there's no way you can afford that. Yeah, there's no. You, there's don't, there's even, no, yeah. you don't even turn up to work. Like, how are you making money, Matt Murdock? <laughs> no real estate in Manhattan is uh, going right. that cheap. Yeah, so Atlanta, yeah, really worthwhile checking out. I think if you go to the SBS website you can uh, catch up i'll check it out I, I love a show that can give you a visceral reaction even when you're on your own oh uh, yeah it's so good that's great my my uh diet at the moment's been alternating between uh attenborough docos uh right. and adventure time <laughs> oh right <laughs> Uh, a friend of mine, he and his daughter really love it. Are you an time. Adventure Time person? No, I've never seen it. It never is read it. I've heard the it's most really sublime thing this shit toxic culture has spat out in the last 10 years, I say. Right. It is beautiful. And why is that? Um, it, it definitely owes a lot to The Simpsons. It feels yeah. like the natural extension of the kids that grew up watching The Simpsons, what they would create. Right. So it's very Simpsonian humour massive world building thousands of characters um it's just it's very very funny and silly but it's also very deep and profound Mm. and it's i I, for me it's like the perfect show for kids because it's all about hey man life is really tough yeah you know and you're gonna meet people that really irritate you and you're just gonna have to deal with that right and it follows chronologically this the, the boy in it he it starts when he's what 12 right and now that it's into season seven or eight he's 17 right so it follows oh. it it progresses through his entire adolescence and right. all the different problems that arise you know so the problems that he's facing when he's 13 are completely different from you know i, I watched one the other day where he for all intents and purposes lost his virginity oh right. um, and it's all you know crazy you know Candyland metaphor but yeah you know it's really um the whole season that i've been going through is he's just finished this long-term relationship there's a character called the flame princess who's made of fire and they like each other 
but they realize they're never going to be able to get close without hurting each other. Right. Because uh, she's made a fire. Right. Um, so he has to wrap himself in tinfoil every time they kiss. Uh, <laughs> and eventually the relationship goes bust. And so the whole season's just been him in a catatonic fugue state. Right. Depressed that his relationship's over and dating all these other princesses and right. trying to kiss as many princesses as he can in a night, but realizing that just leaves him empty, even though he thought it would make oh, him feel great. Oh, great. Man, it's fucking... Right. It's so beautiful. And the animation is gorgeous. Yeah. That's one of those shows, like, I will laugh out loud even when I'm on my own. It's, yeah. uh, it's one of those shows I started watching back when I was getting stoned all day, thinking there's no way you could ever enjoy this show, not high, it's so crazy. And now I watch, you know, I watch it completely sober at 11 o'clock at night and I'm crying and laughing. Right. And it's, I think you'd really love it. I, d- I don't necessarily think uh, getting high actually makes uh, everything outside of food better. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I yeah. was saying to you before, it doesn't, people think, you know, like you'll say, oh, I saw this movie, I was high and it was amazing and you only thought it was great because you were high. No. Yeah. It just makes whatever more. Right. So if it's something shit, it just makes it shitter. Oh, makes it more shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ter- like it makes it go forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, why have I done this? This is just... <laughs> I feel like I'm losing my mind. Um, something else that's positive that I wanted to say to you is I picked up uh, this book of short stories. Oh by yeah. I think. It's, what do you? Re- how do you? How would you pronounce his last name? Chang or is it Chiang? Chiang. Chiang. I'm not sure, but it's uh, the it's the author that wrote the book Story of Your Life, which is the inspiration for Arrival. Oh, really? And so, weirdly enough, that is the w- one short story that I haven't gotten to yet. But every one of these short stories that I've read so far are absolutely brilliant. Yeah, right. And he's obviously got a real science background. There's one short story that talk that is the breakdown of a relationship that is played out in um, like a like an equation. And, oh, and, wow, and there's the basis, diagrams here and everything. Yeah, and the basis of the story is that a woman works out mathematically that essentially maths is wrong. And so that's it's, <laughs> a, it's almost it's almost like proving that God doesn't exist. You know, yeah, how, wow. how do you live? And so, but the whole story breaks down into nine chapters that are like a formula. <laughs> the, and the first story is about the Tower of Babel uh, but it's almost told not from a spiritual point of view, but from a from an engineer's point of view. You know, like how long it takes to get up there, the people that are living up there, wow. the plans on what happens when they break through heaven's vault. Uh, you know, th- when when someone falls to their death, everyone just keeps working. But if someone drops their trowel, oh, it's a disaster. <laughs> you know, because now th- it's going to take you a month to get down to. Get your trowel. You know, it's it's. I must borrow this off you. Oh once man, you're when I'm done, it's it is great. Uh, and anyone who is uh, looking for a for a book to read, it is sensational. Stories of your life, Ted Chang or Chiang, and uh, yeah, I'm as I said, I'm only like <laughs> I'm only like three stories into it. Uh, oh, and the other one is. Uh, a guy gets uh, given a hormone. Uh, he's been in an accident, gets given a hormone that will bring him back to life. But the hormone just makes him smarter and smarter and smarter. Oh. And then, and that, fuck, that could be everything from a great sci fi yeah. movie to a hell of a one man play. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's great. Sci fi is, um, I heard an idea that was, I think it was Isaac Asimov in the 60s or something it was this short story about people living um every individual there's only like a thousand people left on earth and Mm. they all live ten thousand kilometers apart in their own individually sanctioned media bubbles oh right literally a bubble lined by tv screens right and there's a line from one of them going touching other human flesh (laughs) you know and i I never feel i always feel anxious if i know that i'm less than ten thousand kilometers away from another human being oh god wow that's really funny you really uh get the nail on the head buddy yeah you uh, really saw into the future and uh really didn't like it did you um did you start the alan moore tome jerusalem no i haven't yet because i've Mm. well because i had the three operations and yeah, yeah, th- yeah. to be honest uh, the, the last book i was reading which is a noah hawley book who is the creator of fargo the tv right. series and legion uh i was really enjoying that but each time that i would 
you know, have an operation. I, I couldn't read for a few, yeah. you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, for yeah, about yeah. a week kind of thing. And also it's festival time. And so um, I'm looking at it as a middle of the year <sighs> run. Did I tell you I finished it? No. Oh. Is it good? Oh, well, look, for anyone that doesn't know, I mean, I'm sure most people know Alan Moore, the comic book writer, but he's written a novel called Jerusalem. How many? It's like, what, 1,800 pages? Yeah, it's like three It's longer volumes. than the Bible. It's longer yeah. than the Bible. And that's the big selling point. Uh, <laughs> that's a weird selling yeah, point. Yeah, I know, I know. Like, like, lots of things could be longer than the Bible and it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean it's good. Um, I fucking loved the first two thirds like i was just right. eating it like loving it right uh and then in the last third i couldn't help but think fuck you man like every page oh you know, really it, it really got to that point where it's every like, page yeah it really got to that <sighs> point where it's like you're being deliberately Obtuse. you're really going out of your way it's like you know especially to do it in the last third where it's like oh you think you're getting through this? You think you're going to finish this easily? Right. Well, fuck you, mate. And just goes right. out of his way. Like there's, there's. Uh, but, so for people who aren't across what this book is, can you give a, oh a, a brief God. synopsis? I don't of, even think I could. Huh? Well, isn't it just set in the one place? And it's, it's set, set in the boroughs of Northampton. Right. And the, you know, he's he's a big proponent of the theory that um, time is a solid fourth dimensional object where all moments. Uh, happen simultaneously. Yeah. And it's only through our three-dimensional perspective that we experience this moment and then that moment and then that moment. Right. And the past is the past and the future is yet to come. But if we could elevate, as you would if you, you know, say you laid out every page of uh, Superman comics from 1930 whatever it was, eight to yep. now, and you laid them all out on a, whatever, a football field or something, right. and then hovered above it, each panel is a moment in Superman's life that's happening in that moment for him. But yeah. from our elevated perspective, we see it as one big hole. Right. And we could dip into any moment. Yeah. And, you know, if there was a fifth dimensional entity looking at our fourth dimensional time space, they could do the same with us. Right. Um, you know, it's the talk- end of Interstellar. Interstellar, Slaughterhouse-Five, yeah. you know, the, Watchmen. Yeah. This, this idea has been around for a long time. Um, it's a fucking fascinating idea because it eliminates uh, human free will. Right. F- human free will is non-existent if that's true. Yeah. Uh, although I was thinking about that, it, that if human free will is a thing that exists, then the human mind must have the capacity to change space-time right. in real time. But that's a whole other conversation. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, Jerusalem is about the this, you know, whatever it is, 10 square blocks of Northampton, the boroughs, uh, and basically the entire history of everything that happened in the boroughs um, from day one to now or even into the future all happening simultaneously and mm. then it, it that that's the best way i can describe it it's really it, it's about everything all right. at once uh it's about his um theories on space time on I- interdimensional travel on history legacy the importance of art uh ev- every everything 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 right um the first section of the book is a bunch of vignettes the second part of the book which is my favorite is kind of like a fantastic five um adventure story with these right. six dead kids yep traversing the different dimensions of reality which is it's fucking delicious right it's great um and what's and the third book the third book is him i don't even fucking know hey the third book is him telling the story but each chapter is in the style of a different author so one is 60 pages of James Joyce Finnegan Wake which is fucking incomprehensible it's incomprehensible right. i know i know uh, my best friend is an english major and even he says uh, james joyce is just lit- lit- literature wank right. um he, yeah he, i i tried to read ulysses and thought life was too short no oh, dude it's so funny Th- this is alan moore in a nutshell he he did another book called voice of fire right and the first 60 pages of that is in joycean language right and there's an interview with him where they say um why did you write the first 60 pages of your book in an incomprehensible gobbledygook? And Alan Moore, without missing a beat, just goes, to keep cunts out of my book. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to make it deliberately difficult for you. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not one to say no to a challenge, but it, did se- it just did seem to be him just masturbating on the page. Right. There's another one that's in the... This is the one that broke me. It's in the style of a Ray- Raymond Chandler novel, right. so hardball detective fiction, but it's being told by a guy who's really bad at writing 
Raymond Chandler novel, uh, fan fiction. Right. So it's sixty pages of just bad random R- R- Raymond Chandler, and it, it like it it really like I was grinding my teeth through it. Like, dude, why this is deliberately torturous, especially two hundred pages from the end of the book. Like, right. why are you doing this? And so. Um, it really killed my enthusiasm and I was really bummed out because I was really into it for the first two thirds. Well, that doesn't really inspire me to start reading it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe you'd like Because I've read reviews that say, oh, they hated the first two sections of the book. Right. I've, I've, I've read reviews that say the section of the book that I love the most was the most tedious to get through. Right. But I love all that dimension hopping and like he does one, um, he does uh, an entire chapter where he describes a single moment happening simultaneously all at once and describes, you know, th- these trails that everyone leaving behind them as they right. move through t- through gelatinous space-time. It's, it's just beautiful language, right. really evocative imagery. Um, is, is, a, is an entertainer's point of view, and, and an author is an entertainer, but, uh, you know, is, is it... Are they meant to make everything accessible? I guess not. No, no not you know, at all. Like we know some comedians who are yeah. fantastic but don't really allow you in. Totally. Uh, I mean, some of my favourite music is that. Yeah. You know, some of my favourite music in the world is the first time I heard it, it was just like I tore the earphones off my head. It was like, shut up. That's horrific. Yeah. Whereas now I listen to it and it's like, oh my God. Like, you get it. Once it unfolded, it was like, this is incredible. But you yeah. have to, it's like you have to learn a new language to understand it yeah um it's a, a, i find the, i find people who do that kind of stuff uh interesting and and i have i have two thoughts on it one of which is an, an in a bias mm. like a complete bias and the other one is uh well the other one is i i'm i'm always impressed with people who can mm. who just go this is my art this is what i'm gonna do if if that means i don't make the money and it means i struggle with other aspects of my life, <clears throat> there's nothing I can do about it because this is what I'm doing yep. and I'm staying true to that. The other side of that, and this is my bias and this is only applicable to some people, is if the artist approaches it in that vein but it turns out they come from money, then I have no <laughs> respect for them because to me, they're not being that brave because yeah. they have heaps of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, agreed, agreed. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but yeah. having said that, if someone has heaps of money and they decide that they are in a position where they can try something different. But do, do you know what I mean? Like there's no, that no, fine yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I know it's a complete and utter bias from my side of things. But and it, It's just whatever appeals to you. I'm sure there's people that are really uh, hardcore literature people that right. read that last section of Jerusalem and think it's the best thing ever written. Right. Uh, for me, it was... Put it this way, my intention... To, when I was two thirds of the way through that book, my intention was the moment I finished the last page to go directly back to the first page and do the whole thing over again. That's how much I was enjoying it. Right. Uh, like it is overwritten and it is overlong and it is wanky, but that's kind of the point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as soon as I hit that wall of that last third, it was like, oh man, you are really fucking, you're really testing my patience. But then, <laughs> you know, but people say that about, you know, like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Right. Uh, and but that's one of my favourite things ever written because right. it is so dense and d- difficult to penetrate. But right. you know, once it clicks, it's like, oh my god, you've created this yeah. completely different dimension. It's amazing. I uh, liked uh, I liked most of that. I didn't like the last one. No, I didn't like the last one. Yeah, the last one was. But the really dense stuff like Black Dossier and the yeah. Traveler's Almanac and stuff yeah. is just so fucking beautiful. But you know, I remember seeing an interview with uh, as a kid, seeing an interview with Elvis Costello where he said, you know, you can be a fan of someone and it doesn't mean you have to like everything that they do. And I was rapt when he said that because there were some of his albums that I did not get into. Mm. Uh, Yeah, no, totally. But it it made me feel, oh, yeah, that's okay. Well, I can be, you know, there's very few people that produce stuff that I'm a fan of all of it. You can't be. I mean, like, I'm a massive Zappa guy. Zappa has 120 albums. Yeah. So, some of them are the best things in the world and some yeah. of them are literally like, turn that off. That is yeah. fucking awful. I listen to every Bowie album. I'm a fan of every... Every one Bo- of them? Yeah. Every but, song? Uh, I would say there's no songs of his that I dislike, but mm. there are definitely ones yeah. where, weirdly enough, it's the... Um, uh, yeah, there, there, there's certain things that I go, oh yeah, that one's not quite so much for me. Yeah. But they're, they're even the shittier ones, I kind of get something out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like all of Nolan's films. I'm like that with Morrison, Morrison yeah. comics. 
but it's very rarely read. A, I'm just <sighs> trying to think if there's anything. I tell I've ever you, read that I, I, I didn't. Like. I, I'll have to reread this. So, uh, but I'll have to. Uh, but I wasn't a fan of Happy. I, yeah. I, but I'll have to reread it. But you know, they're making that into a series, yeah. and I'm so. I was like, because it's easy. I know. They can I do so heaps of ultra violence in it. Of all the of all the things Morrison's done, where's that We Three cartoon? Did you read Nameless? Yeah. <laughs> I know some people that really hated that. That really fucked me up. Right. That really fucked me up. I had to do. I, I don't often do magic rituals. Right. But I did a banishing ritual after I read that. Oh really? Yeah. I was right. really. I was really superstitious that it was gonna crawl into the dark folds of my brain and fuck me up somehow jesus what did yeah. what was the what was the ritual that you did oh just a really simple banishing ritual right uh, have you ever done any no like really so you've been yeah. reading morrison for ages you've never done a sigil magic or anything like that uh i've tried it i don't know if it really worked but I, I, I you have to you, you have yep. to you have to totally buy it yeah for it to work it doesn't work if you don't believe it yeah and it's, i think that's the problem yeah 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 if because there were years that i couldn't do it because i just felt silly Right. Uh, but then, you know, a lot of the books I was reading about it was, you know, you must wear a brown cloak made from <laughs> silk. Yeah. And you must face the northeast sun and say thank you to the cat who walks through the raindrops. I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. Right. Um, but then I read another book, a, a really good one. If you're actually, if you're interested in this, there's a great book called Postmodern Magic. Right. Uh, and it taught, it basically, the whole premise of the book is saying, look, when you do magic, you're not actually talking to spirits. Yeah. You're talking to a part of your brain yeah. that is difficult to access without a narrative. Right. And so you tell it a narrative and you believe the narrative, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so it's basically, you know, a spell can be whatever you want it to be. It's just whatever feels right to you. Right. Um, so, yeah, I did. I, I had to do it. I, it just really fucked me up. I was scared yeah. I was going to have nightmares or... It was it pretty was, dark. It was really fucked up. Yeah. Like on a really, I know that was the point. It was using nightmare logic in yeah. the storytelling, but it yeah. was really. I don't normally get viscerally fucked up by a comic like Burnham's that. artwork is yeah, on really the money gross. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. full on. Great book. Uh, we should finish up because uh, we we both have to get going. Yeah. But this is going to go up. Uh, I'm going to put this up today. Uh, so, uh, fuck club on. Oh, we're taking the week off. We right. needed a break. Uh, so we're back on the 19th of March, and we have a stellar show uh and yeah that'll be going all the way through fuck till we get booted out of the pub which i don't think we will they're they're big fans of us oh yeah well, that, <laughs> that comes in handy doesn't it uh i'm in adelaide this weekend my show bunter boy uh 5 30 saturday and sunday uh so please come down and check that out only two shows uh which is unfortunate it's like it's such an adelaide show like it's so you know it's about the first five years of my career yeah. it's so infused with stories of adelaide and um and it, i was really wrapped that it worked really well in in perth yeah so it's like oh this is like the perfect adelaide show oh only two shows just making killer shows man mate i'll just fucking nail it mate <laughs> and uh and then after that it'll be uh, the melbourne comedy festival and sydney comedy festival you can go to uh justinhamilton.com.au to find stuff about that or even uh, comedy.com.au uh, has details there and the shelf is really close to being sold out uh, go to mosh ticks if you would like tickets for that i think all the i think all of the season tickets are sold maybe maybe there's one but I, i'm not even sure that's still there uh, but if you would like to check that out big lineups during the melbourne comedy festival so that will be a lot of fun and people are you are you, are you on uh, social media that much? I feel like I've seen you pop up a little bit. Oh, very rarely. I was actually off Facebook for a couple of years, which was mm. brilliant. Mm. Uh, but since running, starting to run Fight Club again, I have to be on it. Just it's easier to get the it, word out and book acts and all that. Yeah. But I try to keep my presence at a minimum. Why? Why yeah. do you ask? Oh no. Well, I was going to say where people could find. Oh, you. Uh, I'm at Ben Elwood. Eleven Elwood is with two L's. So at Ben Elwood one one on Twitter. I yeah. occasionally tweet. Yeah, and then you can find out some more details yes. as well. Uh, oh fuck. No. I didn't even think to ask you. I'm. Th this was not planned. Mm. I didn't even think to ask you to tell us that story. <laughs> I pro you know what? I'm going to write it in my diary. It's been weeks. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. People keep saying, "Are you doing this deliberately?" And I, said, and I was, and I made the joke in the last one and saying, "Oh, maybe I am," but I, I actually haven't. It's going to end up being so anticlimactic oh, if I ever do tell it. This is but perfect. sure, we'll do it next time. We'll do it next. We'll time. We'll do it next time. Maybe, sure. Maybe we'll. Oh, fuck. Anyway, <laughs> definitely next time. <laughs>